everyone and welcome to Live from the Lab. This is the show where we talk about different technologies that Brooker has developed to help scientists discover the world around us. Today's topic is power, specifically power of the D6 phaser. D6 phaser is a brand new benchtop instrument that was released uh, just a few months ago. And this episode is part of a three-part series. So the first part, we talked about accessibility, and today again we'll be talking about power. Now in order to demonstrate that power, we're going to be looking at powder samples. So power really isn't necessarily just about the generator itself, but it's also about all the optics and components, and we'll touch base on that. It's a topic we like to call signal. So with that, let's go ahead and watch a little video so we can learn a little bit more about the D6 phaser, and then we'll come right back and see the instrument in action. Welcome to the studio. So uh, we have now the D6 phaser here, and I'm also joined by Nick. Hey, John. Thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. So Nick actually has some history with the machine that came before this, the D2 phaser, right? That's right. So uh, primarily I used to work with the D2 phaser. That was yeah. uh, kind of the instrument that I uh, specialized in. And now that we have the D6 phaser, I've yeah. kind of taken over that. And actually, before you joined Brooker even, at your previous job, you were a customer That's with right. a D2 phaser, I right? Used, I used to be a customer. We had a research project that required diffraction, and the D2 phaser checked all the boxes. So I um, had about six months of experience with that before coming to Brooker. Yeah. So now the D6 phaser itself, what's your general impression of that 
versus that D2 phaser. I mean, it does everything the D2 does, but it does it just a little bit better, and it does a lot more. So a wider breadth of applications. And certainly one of the th contributors to that is the power. So power is the topic for today. It certainly is. So I guess the elephant in the room being the generator power. That's right. So speaking of that, if we bookend it, right, the D2 phaser, the previous gen, that was? So um, that was a 300 watt system. Okay. That one run, uh, ran at 30 kilovolts and 10 milliamps. Um, the D6 now is, uh, there's a couple options for generators. One is a 600 watt generator that runs at 40 kilovolts, 15 milliamps. Okay. And uh, the next step up from there is a 1.2 kilowatt generator, and that runs at 40 kilovolts and 30 milliamps. All right. And for uh, any of our viewers who live in a country or if you, if you have a company where it's advantageous to still have that 30 kilovolt limit, uh, we do have that available too. So that's a 540 watt that's uh, right. that runs at 3018. And uh, that can help you with any of the regulatory things. Yeah, that's so. exactly right, Ben. Now, 1.2 kilowatts, just to put that into perspective though too, you know, sometimes you think about a floor standing machine, three kilowatt generator, that's very common. The yeah. reality is that it's not normally run there, right? That's right. We don't run those three kilowatt generators at, at the high end there. So uh, those typically run for copper at 40 kilovolts and 40 milliamps. So even though we have a three kilowatt generator, we're oftentimes only running those at 1.6 kilowatts. All right. So it's really, I mean, we're talking here now benchtop form factor, 75% of that power. Right. So even though it's 75% of the power, uh, oftentimes we're getting more photons onto the sample because we don't have... Uh, problems with air scatter, right? Our radius is a little bit smaller on this system. All right, so signal, right? Signal is the name of the game. That's right. Okay, and that's like one big tip for everybody out there. If you're ever comparing things, comparing measurements and that, it's not just about the power number. It's not about the intensity of a peak. You can scale that stuff. It's about signal to noise, signal to background, right? Right, and all of this comes with how all of these components are interacting together. It's about the entire system and the efficiency of it. All right, so speaking of the system itself and that efficiency, let's go ahead, let's take a look inside. Sure, so we've got the door open here. Uh, if we take a look inside the system, uh, I know this might be backwards for our viewers where the tube is uh, on the right side. So we have our x-ray tube over here. This is a 2.2 kilowatt tube, but okay. again, we're only running it at 600 watts or 1.2 kilowatts. Uh, right in front of that, we have our motorized optic. Um, now on the D6, this is an option. Of okay. you can do a motorized optic like we have here, or you can do a fixed slit uh, like we used to have on our D2 system. Now, going back to the tube, uh, yeah. is this a special kind of tube that allows that kind of power, or? No, so this is exactly the same tube that we use um, on all of our XRD instruments. So all right, and is that something that's fixed, or like for the lifetime of the machine, can you change that? Yeah, it's definitely interchangeable by the user. It doesn't okay. require any sort of special service visit or anything. Um, What's nice about the D6, about the enclosure, is the way the door opens, you have access on the top. So that's how we have our, our camera looking down here. So it's really easy to access the tube and change it out yourself. All right, so now you said the slit, and then this was the optional one with the motorized slit in it. Yep, so we have a motorized slit here. Okay, um, and, and then in our, there, there's also something called a solder, right? There is, so if we were to remove this little top plate, there is an axial solder. So we have uh -huh. the axial solder that matches on the primary and the secondary side. Okay, and what does that solder do? Yeah, so that solar uh, limits axial divergence. So okay. basically the x-rays that are traveling d straight from the tube to the sample can pass through the solar unimpeded. Mm -hmm. But the x-rays that are traveling maybe at kind of an off direction um, will hit those copper plates and be absorbed. All right, the way I like to think about it, it's kind of like really long Venetian blinds. So it only <laughs> right, lets exactly. that light in come at a certain angle, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. All right, so we said that, and then you get to the sample. Yep, so here we have our uh, rotation stage. So this okay. one is for a single position. Uh, this is our powder stage. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that, uh, we also have this little air scatter screen. I know it may be hard to see from the top view, but that is to block air scatter. Okay. Now, when it comes to samples, uh, there's a whole lot of different sample holders themselves. So if we're thinking about power and signal for that mm -hmm. matter, um, we'd always want to be having the most sample we can, right? That's right. So uh, there's different options for, of course, how much sample you have. So our yeah. standard holders have a 25 millimeter diameter uh, cavity. We have ones that are a little bit larger, a little bit smaller. It all depends on your application and how much yeah. material you have. And available. if you don't have enough material to fill the cavity, the whole cavity, mm -hmm. then what's what should people we have do? these low background holders that are made out of silicon? Okay. So with that, you can go down to as little as maybe a few milligrams of material and still get a decent XRD pattern. So it's important though for everybody: don't partially fill these holders. Make sure you got a nice flat top to it. That's right. Exactly. Okay. If you don't have enough material to fill the entire cavity. 
go to one of those little background holders and you'll have a lot more success with that. All right. So secondary side now, what do we got going yep. on? So on the secondary side here, we have this optics mount. And you can see we have a 2.5 degree solder in there right now. Um, and then behind that, we have our detector. And this is our Linksight XCT detector. Okay. So now this, the solder, for example, that's fairly easy to exchange, right? It sure is, yeah. There's just a little plunger on the bottom. Push it up and swap it out for something else. Okay. And what sizes typically would people be using for those? So the 2.5 degree solars are kind of our standard solar. Um, okay. It's a good mix of uh, intensity and resolution. Um, All right. It works really well for just about any scan range that you would want to use. So with solars, really what's happening is you've got this, you, you, if you imagine a point beam coming in, right? You hit the sample, you're going to actually get not a single diffraction event, you're going to kind of get a ring of diffraction events. And if you imagine now that Instead of a point beam, you have a whole line of point beams with all these rings coming off. You've got all these rings. It'd be very blurry. And what the solar does is it's going to limit that angle, the left-right angle here. We call the axial direction. And uh, that's going to give you those sharper peaks. It's going to reduce, in particular, it's a leading edge defect, right? That's correct, yeah. Uh, you'll always typically see it on the low 2 theta angle side, so on the left side of the diffraction peak. And, and then the other thing, though, to be aware of, too, if you see a, that side of the peak is getting a little broader, it could also be specimen transparency, right? That's right. Of course, these have different 2 theta dependencies. Yep. The, the broadening from the axial solars will typically happen at lower 2 theta angles. The sample transparency yep. will be a little bit higher. But solars, an easy way to check. Just swap them out. You're good to go. And you, get, you can get an intensity bonus there too, right? That's right. Since we're talking about signal today, uh, let's say maybe you're running a scan in the 2.5 degree solars. Uh, maybe you just want a little more uh, improved signal to noise. Yeah. A really easy way to just boost your signal by about a factor of four is to take out these 2.5 degree solars and put in four degree solars on both sides. All right, and when we're talking about these factors, factor four for the solars, uh, the way that the signal quality scales is the noise decreases as a square root of that intensity gain. So that factor of four, that's going to buy you two times faster scans or get to the same result, or I should say for the same amount of time, get half the noise. Right, exactly. So square root there. Um, so very, very efficient way though. Boost signal, boost speed, right there, change them out. Yep. The reality is, coming through the doors here, you're not seeing so many samples that need 2.5s even, right? No, I mean, well, it, it, again, it depends on the application. Yeah. Um, 2.5 uh, fits, fits the bill for most applications, yep. but again, if we need to go to the fours, we have the flexibility to do that. Um, we can also go the other direction. Um, and go to 1.5 degree solars. Uh, since we have a higher power generator, we have some extra yeah. flux to play around with. Yeah, and that's one of those real big benefits of that extra power is you can play with it and then really optimize the system setup. Right, right exactly. So now the, the detector, the Linksight XCT, mm -hmm. that's kind of a unique detector out there, right? Yeah, so what's unique about this one is uh, it has really good energy resolution, meaning that we can focus in on mm -hmm. a, a specific band of wavelengths that we're interested in. So for a typical powder diffraction experiment like we would do here, uh, we would want to focus in on those copper K-alpha energies. Um, and this can do that and electronically discriminate against the K-beta mm -hmm. energies. Now in the past, you would have to use like a, a graphite monochromator actually in front of the detector to get that sort of yep. effect. Either a monochromator or a, a nickel filter. Okay, yeah, a metal filter. Mm -hmm. And that metal filter typically, well, what do we see there for the gain? Yeah, of course that? it depends on the thickness of the nickel yep. or of the metal filter. Um, but, it, you know, you might attenuate your beam by about 50%. Yeah. And one thing also to note is, you know, K-beta is part of the equation there. The other that you had mentioned is sample fluorescence in the background, That's right? That's right. So if you have uh, maybe a lot of iron in your sample or cobalt or manganese, um, all of those elements will fluoresce under copper x-rays. Um, yeah. And that fluorescence, you know, it happens at all two theta angles throughout your entire scan. And what that does is it raises your background and makes it a lot more noisy. Uh -huh. um, so by having this detector and being able to focus in on that copper K-alpha energy, we're able to eliminate all of the fluorescence coming from the sample. Yeah, and that's one of those things that I know I've heard a few people talk about is the idea that, well, you know, full-size machines, you can also get mirrors and such to get rid of the beta. But the reality is those mirrors aren't helping you with the fluorescence from the sample. That's right. The fluorescence, yeah, um, yeah. And, and even the resolution. Yeah, so really here what we're talking about is that the XCT detector, that's going to take care of fluorescence the beta, all of that. It's going to give you excellent quality data, make it faster. Yeah, right? and it's always operating in that mode, so it's not even something we have to think about. 
All right. So in order to actually, though, kind of put the proof into pudding, right, I know you've prepared a few scans here that we'll be able to see this thing run live. Yeah, so right now the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to run a, a kind of a standard Bragg-Rentano fixed slit scan. We have our corundum sample right here. All right. Um, so we have, we're going to use the fixed slit on the primary side. Yep. Uh, we have our fixed air scatter screen above yep. our sample, and uh, we're going to use our Linksci XCT detector. So we'll load right. the sample in. That's actually one nice thing. Uh, Nick was closing, putting the sample up, and in some systems, they don't have a window. Yeah. And man, more than once I have put the sample in and forgot to put it up. It, I've done the same thing. I start my scan and I see yeah. the data coming up on the screen and I say, what, where's my signal? Yeah, so the fact that you can see that right there, that's really great. Now, uh, I noticed the x-ray light's coming on. Now, with the 1.2 kilowatts that we're talking here, mm -hmm. um, first of all, is there an external chiller? That is required. No, and that's what's remarkable about this 1.6 kilowatt uh, system is it still 1 uses. 1.2 kilowatt. Or, yeah, 1.2 kilowatt. Sorry, is it still uses an internal cooling system? So okay. there's no external chiller, no external water lines. Everything is self-contained within the enclosure. And here. Do you have to worry then about the room heating up or the instrument inside heating up? Nope. Uh, we've got some little clever pathways for uh, heat dissipation. Um, yeah. So it. it really doesn't get too toasty in your room. Yeah, in fact, the whole bottom of this thing is just like air filters, and like huge amount of air that we can move through that machine in order to keep yeah, things our, cool. And our engineers were very conscious of the airflow and have done a really great job with it. All right, so the arms are starting to move, so I'm guessing we can switch over to the computer and we're going to start seeing a scan pop up here. Huh? Yeah, should take just a minute. This is a, for demonstration, we're doing a really fast scan here, so we're, it's about yeah. 70 seconds. All right, so it does look a little noisy, everybody out there, but the reason why is we're talking 0.01 seconds per step. Yeah, really fast yeah. scan. Um, and it'll scale once we hit our first peak at around 25. Yeah. And I see that you still have a really tight increment, 0.01, so you can see, see really sharp peaks too. That's right. right. These corundum samples uh, have very sharp peaks. So in yeah. order to get enough data points, we have to use a very small step size. Yeah. So what you're trying to demonstrate here is not necessarily that we have the lowest noise, mm -hmm. but rather 70 seconds. I mean, wow, 10 to 80 degrees. That's like, what is it, a second per degree? Uh, they're about, yeah. Yeah, with 0.01 step. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. And here, in terms of signal to noise, I can see a bunch of these little peaks. That might be a secondary phase here. Yeah, there might be yeah. some sort of little binder in there. Yeah, sometimes we might get a little halite or yeah, a binder like you said on yep. the sample. Uh, but the fact is, even in 70 seconds, we're starting to see this stuff. That's, that's pretty amazing. That's right, yeah, having the, the smaller radius, um, the 1.2 kilowatts yeah. and the XCT detector together uh, really make the scan incredibly good and incredibly yeah. quick. And now you mentioned the radius. Mm -hmm. That's a huge contributor to our signal, right? In a, in a variety of ways. It is, and, uh, it, and you, it really comes from air scatter. So yeah. if you have a larger radius than air scatter, uh, you lose a lot of signal to that. Um, so by having the smaller radius, we're not losing yeah. as much signal to air scatter. So basically we have more x-rays making it to our sample and more of those x-rays then make it to our detector. And another so, benefit is the size of the slit that you can be using, right? That's right. So by using a smaller radius, we can get away with using a larger slit. Okay. And that all of this stuff boosts the power. Mm -hmm. It's going to boost the signal. It's going to give us the fast times like this. But yet, I mean, here, I'm just going to zoom in on that computer to see some of this resolution. I mean, you're still talking about this amazing resolution, even in this fast scanning. Yep. We have so, a very good Kalfa 1, Kalfa 2 splitting. The 2.5 degree solids are doing a great job with getting us some great resolution. Yeah. Yeah. And for that matter, like you had said, if we were to change those out to fours, lose a little bit of resolution. Just gain, a little bit. Gain four times the intensity. That's right. Wow. But we have another way. Really? That we can get some more intensity. OK. How's that? Um, well, we have this motorized slit. Yep. So the scan we just did was done using a fixed slit. You can see okay. 0.6 millimeter slit. So here in the software, right here, right, we've got that slit size. Yep. So we have it fixed yep. at 0.6. So it's the same size throughout our, our entire scan. Okay. Um, but now on the D6, since we have that motorized slit and another component called the motorized air scatter screen, mm -hmm. we can change the size of the slit and the height of the screen dynamically while the scan is running. Okay, so I think I've heard of this before. It's dynamic beam optimization. Yep, right? DBO for short. Um, and what that allows you to do is have the optimized mm -hmm. slit size for every angle in your scan. Now, since we're talking a small radius though, and the samples are fairly big, mm -hmm. um, how, can we actually open the slit enough to cover that whole angular range and maintain a linear you, opening? You absolutely can. Of course, okay. it depends on the size of your sample. Yeah. Um, yeah, why don't we do one and, and All right, let's you. check it out. Let's see. So let me get my 
Air so this is the air there. scatter screen, huh? Yep. So this is just a little okay. component that bolts right on. Plug it in, and we'll set it up in the software. All right. And one thing that's kind of neat about the D6 is things like this. You can easily add them at a later date. Um, all of the stages, they're configured with the right little piece to mount it on, that little bracket that you'll see here. And, uh, yeah, Nick's just going to screw it on. Yep, just a single screw holds it in place. And another neat thing is that because this is using a form of that DaVinci design uh, for the system, uh, he can plug it in because right now the, the system configuration doesn't have it in there. Uh, so it's not powered. That's right. All right. When it's so not mounted, it's powered off. All right, so now we'll go over here to the software. We can go to our DaVinci tab. All right, right. Same as on the big floor standard yep. models. Yep. Uh, go to our sample stage here, and we can tell it that we have the air scatter screen attached. OK, we'll and that. there we go. We Pretty switch simple. back to the commander. Now we can see that we have that air scatter screen showing up here, so we have access to it. All right, and I noticed then that that one had this yellow triangle next to it. What does that mean? That's right. That means that the drive is not initialized. OK. Um, in other words, the system doesn't know exactly where it's positioned. So. And what was kind of nice is it even showed then the little box there to fix that, remedy That's the situation. That's right. You hit that little initialization button, yep. it does its thing, and now we have the green checkbox. Box. All right. So now, do we have to change any settings on that scatter screen? Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to set it to the automatic mode. Okay. So what it will do is it will take the divergence slit size and the two theta angle and calculate what the optimum height for that air scatter wow, screen should be. Wow, that's a lot of math. Yeah. It's, it, <laughs> luckily, it's doing the math and not me. Especially when you think about the, <laughs> that it's a diverging beam. Yep. And on top of it, you have an angle changing. And things are moving. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, and the, it's wow. a lot. Okay. And then the second thing we're going to do here is change our motorized slit to fixed sample illumination. Okay. And all we have to do here is tell it how large our sample is. So we'll say okay. we want to do a 15 millimeter sample illumination. So now it's going to always maintain a footprint of 15 millimeters. Exactly. Now, when you have a round sample. Yep. You don't necessarily want to set the like the diameter, right? Right. You want to calculate how big of a square can you fit inside that round sample. All right. Now, it's, it's also kind of an interesting topic, because once you can start to illuminate the whole sample, mm -hmm. you start thinking about something like rotation. That's right. And rotation is such a funny thing. I think that everybody always thought, oh, yeah, rotation, you got to have rotation to get rid of the specimen artifacts, stuff like that. But the reality is, is that your biggest benefit is by illuminating the whole sample with the rotating. That's right, because then you're actually seeing uh, more particles. Your, your sampling yeah. is getting better as you're spinning the sample. Yeah, so when you actually illuminate the whole thing all the time, rotation becomes less important. That's true. Yeah, I still, if, if you got it, use it. I, I always <laughs> use it when I, when I can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you got it, use it. But, you know, this helps to decrease right. any problems. So here we go, our scan is starting, and we'll throw up the previous measurements so we can all see right. how much more intensity so, we're going to get now. And I noticed here, uh, same scan parameters then. Mm -hmm. 10 to 80, 72 seconds, 0.01 step. This thing is going super yep. fast. All we did was we changed the mm -hmm. motorized slit to okay. be a, a variable, mo variable slits, and we added on the motorized air scatter. Screen. All right. So starting at the low angle, the benefit I'm seeing here is that that background really stays low. That's right. So you can see, uh, of course, at the low angle, because we have that motorized slit, where okay. we don't have as much air scatter because the slit's a, a little bit smaller. And it goes down because the slit's actually closed more, right? That's right. And then as it scans up to higher angles, our mm -hmm. background goes up a little bit more. Okay. And you can really start to see a benefit if we zoom in here, some of these peaks, and you can see how much more intensity we're getting, and you know, in some cases, double. Yep. And it just gets more and more and more as we go out to these higher angles. All right, so that slit is opening up. We do see a little bit less resolution, but that intensity gain is quite phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And one other thing to note for everybody out there is that we did see kind of how that intensity or the background goes up over time, but you can bring it in EVA and it has a normalization That's algorithm. right, uh, because we still have, uh, uh, we know exactly how big that slit is. There's yeah. an intensity correction that we can apply in the software. Yeah. Um, and if we intensity normalize it, the scans will basically look exactly the same, except we'll have much better signal to noise at the higher angles. And that's where it matters because. Right, because those peaks are generally yeah. lower in intensity. That's just and scattering factor see. physics, right? That, I mean, right. you get less intensity at the higher angles. So, yeah, so look but at man, that. look at that. Look at how much more intensity yeah. we get. And the resolution is still quite yeah. good. We're still seeing quite good peak separation. So now, where is it important to measure over large angular ranges? Yeah, well, it depends on the application yeah. and what your material is that you're analyzing. Um, the really the, one of the big benefits of having these motorized slits is when you're scanning both low and high angles in the same measurement. Okay. So what kind of samples would we do that with? Uh, maybe something like zeolites or, or right. moths. Um, have those peaks below 10, also have peaks out at higher angles. Um, that so can be very low So physically in the sample, the low angle peaks correspond to what? 
Uh, those correspond to uh, maybe lower Miller indices or maybe the actual size of the unit cell. Okay, so that's, that's because these are kind of these superstructures, so you get those peaks down there. Mm -hmm. And in the high angle stuff, that's giving you the little intricacies of the... Exactly, especially bits. if you're trying to do things like maybe structure solutions, and you need to right. have the intensity and all yeah. those little peaks yeah. um, to determine where your electrons are. Yeah, another place I know this was really challenging in the past was clay analysis and clay speciation. Right? Yeah, yeah, well clay, clay analysis is always going to be a challenge, I think, but in terms of getting the best signal to yeah. try to solve that, um, these motorized slits really help. Yeah, I remember visiting some people once <laughs> out there, and man, we were struggling because they really wanted the 1D detector for the advantage of the speed. Yep. But at the time, we didn't have all this um, optimization steps, and you would either set that air scatter screen higher, okay, now you can get all the good high angle peaks, but your low angle, not right. so good. It's really difficult to optimize for both. So if you're optimizing yeah. for low angle peaks, like clays, uh, you have to close down your slits. You have to use a smaller divergence yep. slit. You have to get that air scatter screen really close to your sample. And those are great for low angles, but for the high angles, you're missing out on a lot of signal that you could otherwise yeah. get. And what's neat here is anybody can really do it, right? I, it doesn't look complicated. Right. We set the air scatter <laughs> screen to automatic, and we told it the size of our yeah. sample. And that's all the input that was required. All right. And that air scatter shield, if you wanted to, you could run that screen in a fixed position too, right? That's true. Yep. OK. So you have that flexibility. It's just kind of an, an overall nice thing to add. Mm -hmm. and. The fact that that, pro that that technology is now propagated from the D8 Advance now to the D6 Phaser is quite amazing. Um, that's an interesting thing about this, I think, when we talk about power now, is because of that small radius, we actually find that this is actually the right tool for certain jobs, even compared to the floor standing units, right? That's right. Of course, all of the, the instruments will have their benefits. Um, certainly, the D6 has some benefits uh, that might outshine some on the D8. But Again, it comes down to the application uh, and what kind of materials you're running and what kind of experiments you need to do. Yeah, and so if you ever you know, wonder which kind of machine would be right for you, well, you know, we got specialists just like Nick here. Uh, and you, know, you can come on in, see it in person. We've got a beautiful building. And actually, right now, the weather is absolutely beautiful here in Madison. Right. Um, or we also do virtual demos, right? That's true. Where yep. you can see the benefits of these different setups uh, and, right and see on the camera. Action, yeah. so, um, now, the machine itself, though, uh, when we're thinking about power, uh, what would you do? So you said, remember, we started by saying you were a customer, mm -hmm. right, at one point with that D2 Hazer. If you had the choice between getting the, upgrading the, the, to the 1,200 watts, the 1.2 kilowatt over the 600, or getting the mass and the variable slit. Ooh, yeah, that's a really tough question. What would you do? Uh, I would probably go with the, the mass and the variable slit, I think. All right. um, I like having the flexibility to be able to run different types of experiments. Um, and honestly, the benefit that you get in being able to open up that slit more and dynamically change it, yeah. um, you know, almost gives me the equivalent of having the upgraded generator. Yeah, I mean, a bigger generator, if you can do it. It's nice to have, but Future it's not proof, required. things like that, yeah. But, most of yeah. the samples that I run on this, on this system are actually with the 600 watt, believe all it right. or not. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's all about that efficiency. It's like car engines, you know, you used to have, if you wanted power, you used to have to, you had the big, bigger blocks, things like that. Now you got turbochargers, superchargers, ways to do these things more efficiently. Same thing here, huh? Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. It also comes down to infrastructure as well. That's now, true. Going back to yeah. when I was a customer, we didn't have a room for a chiller and water lines and a high voltage uh, power outlet. Yeah. So, uh, that's why we ended up with the benchtop. We didn't have a lot of space yeah. or infrastructure to, to host yeah. the larger systems. All right, and speaking of, of cooling, just to kind of reinforce that, the 1.2, you don't need the external chiller. That's right. It's all contained yeah. within the enclosure here. Yeah. But if you, if, you do have it, if you do have water in your building... Th that's certainly an option. Yeah, you can get a version, actually, that will that's use right. that. You can have external plumbing if, yeah. if you like to have that. Yeah, and, and the power, then, is a little different on this one, too, right? So you can use the... Like here in the U.S., we have 120 volts... You can use that on 600, 1200 watt though, you gotta go You have to, to have higher. the higher voltage power line. So yeah, 208 to 240 um, is what's required for the 1.2 yeah. kilowatt model. Yeah, nothing super exotic. You know, think, like what's running your refrigerator, what's running <laughs> your dryer. Right. It's what your stove is plugged yeah. into in your kitchen at home. I guess your EV, what your EV would plug into, the 208 <laughs> yeah. outlet. 
Yeah, don't even need crazy amps. So. Yep, nothing but, fancy. And then the yep. 600 watt model plugs into any standard uh, 110 wall outlet, just like the D2 did. Yeah, there we go. So we've got a few questions that came in. If anybody else has questions though right now, go ahead, type those in right side of the screen. Uh, if you are watching this later or you think about something later, you can always send your questions in to live.events at broker.com. Now to get to our first question, uh, some people had sent them in before from Zhang. How often do you top off the cooling water with this 1.2 kilowatt behemoth? Yeah, that's a good question. So you would think that the higher power means that the system would burn through a bunch of coolant really quickly. Yeah. But yeah. that's not the case at all. It's a okay. closed loop system. So uh, just like on the D2. So what I'll do is every few months, there's a little site indicator on the back that tells you if the coolant level is high or low um, and just top it off as necessary. Uh, all right. I had a half liter bottle on my yeah. system and that will last you usually several years. Um, it and doesn't just, really go through cooling. And to be clear, much. this isn't just water. That's true. It's not, uh, it's not just water. It's a mix of water and ethylene glycol. So uh, if you are topping off your benchtop uh, coolant reservoir, um, be sure to use the right coolant type and not just yeah. distilled water. Yeah, that helps with things like algae because, you know, since it is a closed system, you're not changing it that much, doing maintenance on it. That, that's right. Yep. That, that helps to keep everything nice and clean. Uh, next question that came in, uh, Marilyn, is what is the expected tube life? That's uh, a hard one. That's that, always that, that a hard one. That is a really one, right? tricky question because yep. uh, the system is so new with the 1.2 kilowatts. Yep. Yep. Um, so for comparison, uh, let's talk about the floor standing models, okay. right? Those yep. are typically running at 1.6 kilowatts. And with normal usage, your average tube might last maybe three to six years, somewhere yep. in that time frame. Uh, then on the other end, the D2s running at 300 watts those tubes would last the lifetime of the system. So we would say maybe 10, 15, 20 years for those x-ray tubes. Um, now this one is somewhere in between there, so yeah. right? It's run, running at either 600 watts or 1.2 kilowatts. So, you know, uh, we don't know exactly how long the 1.2 will last. I would guess 10 years plus. Yeah, and you know, when you do change, the thing about changing tubes, I, it used to be, if you have an older machine, you go, oh, I ran a tube for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? The reality is at 20 years, you weren't getting very good intensity, right? Right. Yeah, so your intensity goes down, you start getting artifacts, and it's a never a good thing if you change your tube and you go, wow, my samples look different, <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> so, you know, be a little proactive. Maybe, you know, maybe the five-year mark, maybe the six-year mark, budget for a tube. You said you don't need a surface visit or anything, you can just drop them in, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's always good to also monitor the intensity of your tube over the lifetime. All right. uh, so, you know, as you start to see the, the power, the intensity start to drop off, you know, set a benchmark and say at this percentage, maybe it's 50%, 60%, yeah. uh, then it's time to replace the x-ray tube. So, and then when you do replace it, or if you ever want to check it, this one has a really cool feature, right, built in. That's right, it's built in from the factory. So on our little operation touch here, of course, also on the PC, uh, there's a, an instrument check where you just hit a button, load in your corundum, and it will check the intensity, resolution, peak position, do all of that for you and provide a nice little report. Yeah. And it writes those right into the database. So you can go ahead, access them and see how your intensity is changing. And especially tracking it over time. Yeah. All right, next question. Uh, from Francois, does turning the generator on and off decrease the tube life? Uh, that is a very good question, right? Um, so the larger floor standing models, they have a little shutter uh, between yep. the tube and the primary optic, right? Um, that means that you can open the door without having to turn off the generator. Um, now on the benchtop models, we don't have a shutter. Uh, there's just not enough room. It's so compact and everything's squished in yep. there. Yep. Um, so to get around that, we just power off the generator before opening the door. Yep. Um, that means that in between scans, changing samples, we have to shut the generator off and then ramp it back on. Yeah. Now, it used to be uh, kind of a process to ramp the power up oh on my the gosh, tube, right? You had the two big dials on the front of your system. Yeah, you, had to turn had them. Always, you always had that post-it note, right? Yep. Turn this, what, turn milliamp first and kill the Right, and second. you had to, you had to be careful with yep. what you're doing. Um, and now these systems, uh, <coughs> the generators are all software controlled. Yeah. So uh, as if I were to turn the generator on, it's going to slowly ramp up the milliamps, ramp up the kilovolts um, okay. in a way that it's not going to damage the filament in the tube. And the same thing happens when you turn it off. It's going to right. ramp it, it down properly. It slowly ramps it down as, so you don't damage yeah. anything. So really, I mean, those effects of uh, turning on and off, I mean, and we've also done this. Not in a problem, our, yeah. Yeah, we've done it in the, uh, the development lab uh, for years, accelerated testing, and we're not seeing degradation. Yeah, our so. engineers set up a script yeah. to just 
X-rays on, X-rays off, just over and over and over again That's for right. a week. So we have thousands of cycles on these uh, tubes and generators to make sure that nothing breaks. All right, next question, Mike Fallon. If the X-ray source and detector are close to the sample stage to increase signal to noise, do you lose peak resolution? You will lose a little bit of resolution. Um, and again, that's instrument resolution. Yes. Right, when we look at a peak profile, there's really two components that are contributing to the resolution. There's the instrument, yeah. which uh, has to do with the radius, the slits, and so on. And then there's also the sample. So you will lose a little bit of instrument resolution yeah. by having a smaller radius, um, but it's really not a lot, right? Most, in most cases, most real world samples, uh, the broadening that you see in those peak shapes is usually coming from the sample or sample related convolutions and not uh, dominated by the instrument. Yeah, and so we did uh, measure uh, silicon standard, the NIST silicon, and there we were able to achieve a full width half max of less than 0.03. I think it was 0.028. 0.028, the, uh, which is yeah. really pretty close to what you have on the large floor standing models with a much right. larger radius. Yeah, so the benefit here is you can close those slits down. You can get that better resolution. You can open the slits up. You can get the better intensity. You yeah. can really optimize. Yeah, for most real world samples, it comes down to uh, the sample itself and the instrument part is just a very small component of resolution that you actually see. That's right. So with that, we are coming to the end of our time. Uh, again, if you have any questions that you think about, you're watching this broadcast later, you can always uh, write them to that email address, that live.events at brooker.com. Uh, this again, this is part two of a three-part series. So next month we'll be back and we'll be talking about the third uh, portion of the machine. So we talked about accessibility. Today we talked about power. Next time we'll be talking about versatility in particular for materials research things. So until then, make sure, well, actually before I end it, thank you, Nick, for joining us. <laughs> it was a pleasure, I John, make sure, And thank you for joining us also. Uh, if you do like this sort of thing, you wanna see more of this content, make sure you like and subscribe. Um, and then until next time, make sure to keep your signal high and your background low. <laughs>